All right, guys, what is going on? Day two of the add 15 miles per hour to your serve and five days challenge. Hopefully you guys tuned in for day one. For those of you that did, drop in the comments section your favorite part. It's probably Nate's face. He's got a really nice face for camera. It's a nice. I got a face for radio. Nice thing you've ever said. Well, you know, I do my best. Let's make this We're excited about today. Exactly today where they are. Today's wow. a big day because we're getting into the, the components of the serve that uh, elude most players, right? We're talking of, of, about the rocket drop and making sure that we're getting into the proper power position in order to get that 15 miles per hour on your serve. So if there's any one day that you attend today is is i would You're say it's selling today. it don't leave this is yeah. going to be Stick this is going to be good for you yeah. um i'm going to throw a couple of things in here again as i told you guys yesterday probably a lot of you are just on facebook and you're like oh look there's scott and nate they're live and you tuned in we actually are doing like a formal five-day serve challenge here it is free and if you haven't registered you absolutely should so i'm going to throw that link in here again and put it up on the screen so if you haven't registered for this thing yet go do that here you're going to get a lot of free stuff that you're going to want and that link is right here and i'm going to leave that up there for a minute and then i know a lot of you guys um purchased the recordings in the middle of the live stream yesterday good idea for sure as you register and i'll throw the link up there again remember the recordings are going to include the workbook that we that we show you here on the big tv it's also just going to give you lifetime access to these trainings so if you missed yesterday or if you just think hey you know I'm not going to make every single second of, of the serve training this week. And you want to see this, you know, on your own time. That's the recordings are for kind of like insurance to make sure you actually add the 15 miles per hour. And we purposely price that at only 49 bucks because uh, we want to hook you up for coming here live. So you're learning about that here. You're learning about it for attending this. We will actually turn this into a course that we are formally going to be selling for 199 bucks next week. So if you want to get this at, what's the math on that? 75% off. Look at you. Go go do that right now. Um, and again, if you haven't registered, do that at this link and I will throw in ba -ba 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 -ba. The cool thing about the workbook too is we get a lot of feedback. Players that are going to the court, right, and, and working on their serve, they can can look at it in real time. They go, okay, all right, these are the parts that I really need to focus on and this is you know, the detailed positions of what they suggested. For sure, yeah. I mean, the, being able to print it out and reference it when you're out there practicing, I think, is is a big win. Of course, I'm biased. Everybody thinks their baby's the prettiest, but <laughs> this will help you, man. If if you're, uh, you know, if you're going through this this training and you're hoping you're just going to remember all of this stuff um, and then go out there and implement it, that's that's not really how we intended it. So that's why we're making the recordings in, in the workbook so cheap. So this is where you can go if you've already registered but uh, decided not to buy the recordings. You can go grab them here. Can you say of, hi to some people? Yeah, lots of feedback here from folks uh, on yesterday. German said the toss practice into another racket in front was his favorite part. Hey, what's up, man? Um, I hope I'm not butchering your name. Pun it? P-U-N-I-T? Pun? Um, I'm not sure if I'm butchering it. I'm really right. sorry. But they said my feet are parallel to the baseline and the back foot a little bit back. Is that an issue? I'm a lefty. That's a question. You know what? We'll, we'll address it. Why not? So yesterday what we discussed is that back foot has to be far enough that it opens the hip. Um, I'll just show you. This is this is for today, but uh, I'll just point to what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this back hip here. That's not on the TV screen. Only I can see that. Well, I was teaching, I was teaching you. <laughs> here we go. Technical difficulties out of the gate. So take a look here, and what's happening is with the feet correctly aligned, it opens up this back hip, right? So we just got to make sure this back foot is back far enough that for me as a righty, my right hip has the ability to open. We talked about how it's just like throwing, right? Except on serving, you're throwing up, you're not throwing out. Yeah, not on a line. Um, but yeah, that, that's the main point. Like if you're parallel, Totally cool. Just make sure that back foot is back far enough that you can rotate and open your hip. That is right. And guys, I'm seeing a lot more questions flow in here. Um, if you weren't with us yesterday, the way this is going to work, we'll run through some material. Um, the whole purpose of this is we really break the surfs confusing, right? It's the most confusing motion of all sports. I hear you say that a lot. I think it's the most complicated. I think a lot of uh, you know biomechanics experts would, would probably agree. I put it in perspective. Pitching, which we all know, throwing 100 miles per hour in pitching it's is complicated. virtually impossible, right? It has six moving parts. Well, hitting a serve has eight. And yeah. it's, it's difficult. So the purpose of this, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. In a tennis lesson, your only real option here typically 
unless you have a coach that just dedicates a whole hour to it. You're usually only getting 10 to 15 minutes to learn eight moving parts. Not very realistic. So what we do here, we take each individual piece out, we break it down, we give you specific drills and progressions. So at the end of this challenge, you should kind of have checkpoints and know, you know, if you were to look at yourself on camera, know what's wrong and what isn't wrong and how to reconstruct what's right. So that's the whole point of this. Yesterday, we talked a lot about the fundamentals. We did get in where to toss and how to toss. So that's a big one. If you didn't see day one, definitely grab the recordings and go watch that. It's a huge one. Today, in day two, give them a little preview. Well, today, in day two, we got to get back to my screen. It's like you don't have fingerprints and the TV doesn't recognize that you're a real <laughs> I, human being. It only likes you. A little sneak peek from day one for those of you that missed it. That's right. Okay, day two. Well, bam we're talking about the abbreviated position to rocket drop to full extension. I mean, this is this is where power comes from. It's getting rocket head speed. Now, we'll talk about the legs a little bit more in depth later on in the challenge, but today is all about the rocket and initiating the movement from right to left. So let's jump right into that. Let's get into the instruction. So the abbreviated piece is important. All right, it's something that we're going to talk about kind of in depth. A lot of players are start their service position exactly what you see here, and they use a pendulum. And, and, and what I'm referring to is they, they start with the racket up, and then the racket drops, and it has to get all the way up to this position. I used to serve that exact way. You know, you can think of, of, of kind of the, the Federers or the, the Pete Sampras's, if you will, uh, Serena. Now, this is the way the serve was taught for really our entire childhood. Yeah. But I don't know one person that didn't serve this way in the 1990s, even early 2000s. But if you are not fundamentally sound, this is also the most difficult way to do it. Your racket is picking up speed in the early stages of the serve, and typically it has to slow down and then pick up speed again, and it oftentimes creates pitches. So what we talked about yesterday is if you're trying to create a new habit, you want to build muscle, new muscle memory, you've got to eliminate the original groove. And if you start where this yellow line is with your racket up and then swinging it down, you're going to end up in waiter's tray or whatever else it is that ails you, no matter what you do, because you're starting in the same groove. So what we're asking is that you start abbreviated just like this. And again, this isn't your final stroke. This is, this is a progression. This is an exercise. We want you to work through this so you feel exactly what we're talking about, particularly with this right, left, right to left motion. This is really... If you had to just pick like one thing to learn from the serve challenge, it's this right here. Yeah. I mean, if you actually look, it's it's become more of a trend. If you look at Taylor Fritz, even Alcarez, Caroline Garcia, Sebastian Corda, the serve is getting it, – it's it's all the confusing stuff is getting eliminated. They're going right to it to where they're not having to have such a big motion. So the big thing to pay attention here is the racket is listed to the right. All right. So the racket is listed to the right. And the strings have to be down. This is really important that the strings remain down. And then equally as important is a passive wrist. All right. Scott talks a lot about, you know, you're, you're swinging a bull whip here. So if my wrist was suddenly engaged, imagine if I'm like trying to support a frying pan. I don't know who holds a frying pan like this. But the weight of, of a cast, cast, cast iron skillet, yeah. It, it would overcome my wrist and really hurt. So I would have to like kind of engage. If you do that, you're swinging a stick. We've got to let it go. We got to stay passive. So you're swinging a bullet. One of the best tennis lessons I've ever given in my life, uh, Caroline Meisel, if you're watching, she went on to play at Vanderbilt, uh, was a student of mine when I coached in DC. Her mom at the time accidentally, I think she was 15 years old, accidentally gave her nighttime Benadryl. Oops. instead of daytime Benadryl. And so she showed up to the lesson very groggy, but grogginess caused looseness. And it was some of the biggest serves I've ever seen her hit because all that tension that exists in the she serve. she could remember them. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's right, exactly. She also <laughs> fell asleep at the end of the lesson. Yeah. No, but for real, I mean, removing tension is going to be a big topic of conversation throughout day two through day three. So it starts right here when we're talking about this right to left motion. If you're flexing that wrist, everything that we're looking for isn't going to be possible. So the right to left motion, what we're referring to, and right now, if you're at home and you you, you have your racket, we're just going to start this by working through, there you can see my, me shaking my hand out, making sure I'm loose, but you're just pulling the racket to your head, and you can think of this as saluting, all right? So you, you know how, you can imagine how loose your hand has to be 
how, how the, the position has to be neutral in order to pull the racket to your head. And this is the beginning stages of the right to left. The racket simply starts from the right and then it moves to the left. So in real time, I'm, I'm choked up because obviously we don't have a ton of space in here, but I want to show you this. I'm simply just taking the racket. Overhead. You need a little more room overhead for this? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. I'll hit the TV and then it'll be perfect. A big mess. You'll also notice as Nate does this, if you'll if you'll show as that moves towards your head, you'll notice we, we say salute, but he is actually covering his head with his racket strings, right? So one of the other analogies we use here is you're kind of using this as an umbrella and you're shielding yourself with your strings from the rain, right? So when that enters over his head, it's really right above his head. So it's not a salute like you're going to crack yourself on the forehead. Please don't do that. That would hurt. You're saluting above your, your hairline here. Okay. So the next piece is, is all about incorporating the tossing arm, right? So that was just the, the hitting arm. So now we're talking about the tossing arm. And what you want to find is as the tossing arm leads, I think this piece is really important. If you look at any professional player on tour, high level player, the tossing arm always leads the motion of the right arm. They shouldn't, they're kind of old school teaching of down together, up together. Well, no more. yeah, please don't do that. Because once these things are moving together and they're moving at the same speed, if one has a hitch, it's going to break down the other one. So, so you want to separate them. And, and here, you can see here, my left arm is working out towards one o'clock. And as it starts reaching the apex, the racket starts moving on the right to left. All right. You, you've heard, you, you know, the, the knocking the cone off the head has been around forever. Uh, Ryan Reedy does a great job with the with birthday hat. I think yeah. that's, that's something that is a, a really cool tool. Um, but here you can see that's that's your right to left motion. So you want to practice this and incorporate it with the toss. So you're tossing. Oh nope, I gave up. I was like, my, my <laughs> arm is too tired. Virtual Nate won't listen to yeah. real Nate. Yeah. All right. So the tossing arm goes up and leads, and then the racket plays catch up. That was a little bit too much at the same time. Here you can see. The left leading a little bit more. All right. And so once you're comfortable with this, the final step is actually tossing the ball here. And here, what you're going to see is the tossing arm goes up, then the racket is following, just like we talked about. You're just releasing the ball. Now, something I want to point out here that I think is really important, and we've done the, a lot of videos on this you can't use your legs to help with the toss. So if you're taking your tossing arm and you're going down to get your knee bend and then you're coming up, well, you're standing up at the most critical juncture. You right. can't then load. So what you want to focus on as the tossing arm reaches its apex your from here. Bend. Yeah. And, as, and guess what? As the legs bend, it assists the racket and moving right to left. So pause there because everybody's brain just exploded at their computers right now. Um, you're like, hold on a second. Abbreviated motion, right to left. Legs can't help my toss. All that's really happening here, and I, I, I want to hear from you guys in the chat because I think for a lot of players, just having somebody who knows what they're talking about, giving them permission to not do this pendulum to start their swing and to just pull right back to here and then immediately go right to left, it's going to be a huge relief, right? It's like, really? Like, I'm allowed to do that? Like, yeah. I, I wish I could start my serve from right here, and you're telling me I can start it from right here and then just work my way there? Like, that's a huge win for a lot of players that we've coached. And then we can show you examples, and we will, of pro tour players that do this. I mean, Roddick basically just pulled back right into that position, almost like a bow yeah, and arrow. Here. Right. So, I mean, this is going to be, I think, a big win for a lot of you that are still doing the pendulum, and the pendulum is what's messing you up. You're so synced where your arms go up together and down together and back up together. That's eliminating all the power in your serve. So that's going to be the big win here. So step one is just get that right hand up, relax the wrist, and think about this right to left motion. Lefties, you can imagine, it's the exact same thing, just on the other side. So we'd be looking left to right. Same exact concept if we just mirrored the TV. Um, but I think really the last piece here with the legs is where you guys are kind of like, ah, that's a lot. So here's what I want you to think about. As your arm goes up, sit in a chair. That's all that's really happening here. If you're having a hard time syncing this up and you can't figure out, you know, when am I supposed to bend my legs? When does that sync with everything else that's going on here? As your arm rises, your knees fall. 
Okay. And we're going to talk about it more later because some of you are asking how well, how far, how much do I bend? Right. You just need to load energy through the ground. You don't have to get your butt to the ground like Roddick did. One point I want to make on this is once you've incorporated the ball and the toss, you know, we were talking before about um, the feet and how they lined up with the hip. Day one, that was a big piece. When you are moving your racket from right to left as I go back here, right, you'll see that the elbow is directly behind my body. And we want to make sure that that elbow – is staying either directly behind us, more like a bublik serve, or it's actually tracking to the left. So as the racket is being pulled to this right to left, you'll notice how my hitting arm, my you can see my bicep there, my massive bicep, skip a few days, I guess that week. But uh, <laughs> this is where you wanna make sure that your arm is here, all right? Not here, because if you start getting this internal rotation, you know. You start in this position, bye bye power. Well, and, and if your arm is there, then you haven't used your hips or shoulders anyway, right? Like it right. would be really hard for you to rotate everything this way and then still leave your arm right here. Like it's it should come with you, and like Nate's showing, be on the backside. Sorry, put the of that, yeah, of that divider line. And the hero here is the hip. That's what we talked so much about yesterday. Why the stance is so important? Because if the stance is wrong, then this just doesn't happen. Right. I uh, will. We're going to talk a bit more about this, but I'll give you some relief here. I think a lot of players think they have to have a huge jump to hit a huge serve. I've had right knee surgery. You've had issues with both knees. You've had a knee surgery too, haven't you? Yeah. So the, the days of us jumping three to six inches off the ground to hit a serve are long gone. And we're both still clearing 120 mile per hour serves pretty regularly, right? So you don't need to think that you're going to sky off the ground and that that's where the power comes from. The power actually comes from pushing against the ground to create resistance and activating that back right hip from that resistance. And I think that's a big misconception. The, the, the thing that jumping does is it just gets you higher off the ground so you've got a little more margin for error over the net. Trajectory. Like, Is there benefit yeah. there? Sure. Is it worth all the complication that it creates for most rec players? Usually not. So um, getting this understanding of how to sync up your knee bend with your arm, we're going to talk a lot more about this, but – just to sort of give you a teaser and, and some relief, you don't have to jump a foot in the air to hit a 100-mile-per-hour serve. Yeah, and Scott's not saying that the power doesn't come from the legs. 50% of power comes from the legs. Just not from the jumping But loading portion. isn't the same as, as having, you know, you don't have to jump 18 inches to load properly. That's right. Shall we move on to the next segment? <laughs> I like this. I'm going to throw this up on the screen. MW says, I think I remember that a coach once told me that in general, the pendulum equals the serve minus 20 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to start using that MW. Yeah. That's true. I mean, look, the pendulum, I think, is just throwing throwing most players off at a rec level. It's just too much stuff. And, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like the Pete Sampras, Valenciano Lopez, those motions are, are so pretty. And they had phenomenal serves. But you're talking about yeah, some of the best athletes. If you're a professional athlete, be, world, always be yeah. a professional athlete whenever you have the option, right? All right. Exercise Bye. number two. This is a huge one. This one, this one really – Kind of was our breakthrough with, with students when we started trying to make players understand about the racket drop. So if you're here because you have a, a waiter tray, that's when your racket gets in this position, like I'm, I'm serving drinks. Delicious. You dropped your drinks. Yeah. Terrible waiter. Bummer. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is going to eliminate that. The biggest problem that players have when they think about the, the racket drop is they think about the racket. Right. Of course you do. That's what, but and that's how a lot of coaches are, you know, making sure that you get the edge down and you're doing this. We actually want you to think about the elbow. We, it, it, and I know you're like, think about what? the elbow pop, not the racket drop. Ooh, man, I'm gonna use that on YouTube later. Wow, that's the title of our next video. Get excited, it's gonna be great. I think I'm sick that day. <laughs> Elbow pop. Come pretty on. Good. Not the racket drop. It's pretty good. So the reason we're thinking about the elbow is that think of it as a lever. I'll just fast forward a little bit. If give the people a little zoom, a, a two ends of a lever can't be in the same side, right? They always have to be in, in the opposite. So if my elbow is give them, up, give them, give them a little zoom. They can't see your beautiful elbow. There you go. If my elbow is up, the racket head has to be down, and this is a much easier way to learn the racket drop and because in tennis we don't really put anything anywhere right if i'm if i'm going to hey i want to swing through my forehand put my forehand to contact well muscles are going to be involved 
what I want to do is have solid foundations where I initiate a stroke, the rocket's along for the ride, and then I make sure with sound fun fundamentals that the rocket ends in the appropriate spot. We worry a ton as coaches about you just creating tension when you're putting something somewhere, Tim. And if you look at somebody who really serves big, they're just sort of slinging their arm around, right? Yeah. You don't see any tension. So if you've ever heard, and throw in the comment section if you've heard this, have you ever had a coach say, you know, touch your ponytail or touch your back with your racket? You're going to flex to do that. Yeah. There's it, That's a stopping point and a point where you shouldn't be stopping. So this concept of thinking about your elbow firing up as if you're lassoing something and that elbow fires up is just going to get more fluid, get you the, the effortless power that you're looking for. When you start to place the racket down your yeah. back, you've sort of it's defeated the whole purpose. So here's the drill. The main thing is that you're not tossing the ball particularly high. right? You don't want, want the ball much higher than this. But you're actually tossing to a point to where, uh, of course, I go much higher. But the lower you go, the easier this is going to be. But you're actually just aiming for the ball with your elbow. Right? It doesn't have to be super dynamic. But what it does is by giving yourself a target, you, you immediately go, okay, I don't have to overthink this. I just need the elbow to go up to the ball. And the way the elbow gets up to the ball is like doing a cartwheel. Don't let the don't, elbow don't upper swing column. up. Yeah. yeah, It's all about getting the elbow to climb. We want the elbow climbing to this position so that it works. Go back to where the elbow is down real quick. Sure. Because we we, we've we taught this on court. We do live serve workshops. And one of the most common mistakes is they're going to take that elbow and they're going to swing it under as if they were going to come in an uppercut. Mm -hmm. Imagine this elbow is actually your hand and you're just going to do a cartwheel. All right, so move your elbow the same way you would if this was your right hand and you were going to cartwheel up to the ball, right? So you're coming at it this way, not this way. That's really important. So if you start doing the drill where you toss and you go like this, it's not really going to get you where you want to be here. So I'm just going to let this play through at, at half speed, but the, don't worry about how amazing contact is. Just it doesn't get the really elbow matter to the ball. if you hit the ball at all or not. It's just, just the concept of thinking about moving your elbow towards the ball in this cartwheel motion is everything here, right? The slow, the slow mo is a lot right now. <laughs> so here we really want to think about using that back leg. I'm going to add that real quick because this is this adds on to what we we're talking about with the stance and loading. So what drives the elbow up? is that back leg. And that's going to take us to our next drill. Just, uh, we, we see some questions that are kind of pop, popping up about yeah, this. Yeah, I, I went to go explain how this works and then I didn't, I completely forgot I realized this as we went through. So yeah, guys, we're going to deliver instruction. I, I actually see your comments. I see uh, Christopher, I see your question. Derek, I see you saying scratch your back. Um, so we will present and then we'll kind of open up the field for questions. We'll, we'll plug away when we get to a nice stopping point where we feel like we've delivered a lot of instruction and we need to open up the floor for questions, we will. So we'll open up the floor, open up the floor for questions, easy for me to say. Uh, once here about in the middle and then again at the end where we'll just field everything. So feel free to throw questions in here as we go. I am going to scroll back up and look through them. We'll answer as many of them as we can. We've got just under 700 people in here watching, uh, but not everybody types in the chat. So you know we'll get through as many questions as we can, I promise. And, and Derek, is now Derek saying, point? well, he's saying, Rack, don't don't scratch your back, buddy, because what ends up no, no, happening? No, no. He, he typed that in because I remember I asked everybody to throw in the comments. How many of you have been told, pat your ponytail oh, they, or yeah. reach your back? Okay. Yes, scratch then your you're back. On is, you're on it. Yeah. To clarify with that, the reason scratch your back my is boy, bad. Derek, don't let Nate mess with you. <laughs> is you never want your racket this close, right? The, the racket operates away from your body. And again, as Scott right. said, you don't want to put anything, anything anywhere. anywhere. The one thing I will add... Um, for very few people, we've had, you know, that this hasn't like necessarily translated. And so we've talked to them about the water. Or, the water. Yeah. You want to talk about that for just a second to like yeah. drive this home? We had, do you remember the guy's name at the Indian Wells Surf Clinic? Where he's like, oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Like there, the, we had a Corey. couple of students, Corey. That's right. Yeah, good dude. We, we had a couple of students that had just like a huge revelation here where we gave them a half full bottle of water. And of course, we don't. Oh, yeah, we do. Um, we gave them a half full bottle of water and we asked them to hold the bottle of water like this and that when they get into the racket drop, all that's really happening is that the water that's in the bottom of the bottle is going to shift and flip over into the back of the bottle. And there's a feeling that, that comes when you're shifting that weight from top to bottom of the water bottle 
where you can tell if you flicked that elbow up and activated it. So if you're looking for just a drill, and if you've got a bottle of water at home right now, drink half of it really quick, throw it in your hand, and just feel, you know, we're starting here in that right to left position. As that elbow comes up, as if I was going to elbow the ball, all the water that's in the bottom here is going to reverse to the top as the bottle as the bottle flips upside down. So watch. So that transition of water from here to here is the feeling that we're looking for. So if you can't do this with a bottle of water, then you're probably not flipping your elbow up and you're not getting that true racket drop. So that's a great exercise if if you try this, you know, elbow the ball drill and it's you're not you're not feeling it. All right, shall we move on to the final step from today? We shall indeed. Exercise numero trace. This is the pul the pulse up drill. For you to say. Get back on camera here. This is the pulse up drill. And this is how we initiate the kinetic chain, right? So the kinetic chain starts with the feet, lower body. And as we fire through the feet, coming through the legs, the hip is the next big spot, right? So from the feet to the hip, and that should translate into the elbow. So let's pull this up. So in this drill, this one's relatively easy once you kind of get the feel for it. And the way it's going to work, same thing with the right to left. You can see here I'm pointing as if I'm initiating the toss. Give me a little more zoom. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm here for the people. Back feet and yeah, my feet yep. are in. You're going. So from here, you can see I'm loading energy down. Let me get my arrow up. I'm loading energy down. And as a result, when the energy comes up, where does the rocket go? It drops. And this is the piece I think for a lot of players, they're just so out of sync that this never happens, right? So again, pulling this out as its own individual piece, I firmly believe as a coach is the only way you will ever learn this correctly. If you try and just learn this in the last 10 minutes of a lesson with anything else mixed yeah. in, it's it's a lot. And don't be afraid of asking your coaches, hey, can we spend 30, 45 minutes working on the serve day and get your hits in or whatever. Spend the whole lesson. That's okay. Yeah. Um, now we you don't want to go three spend, hours on it in our workshop. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to spend three hours for seven days a week and you know, hurt your arm. But well, we don't that, want you necessarily hitting ball. Like if you come to one of our serve workshops, we're not hitting balls for three hours. We're running you through these progressions so you can feel each piece and then we're putting them together. You're probably only hitting for maybe even an hour and a half total with lots of breaks. And yeah. So again, energy loads down. As the energy goes up, the racket drops. Now here's the pulse up piece. The pulse up is what's happening with your back leg. So I wanna rewind this. The back leg fires the hip and that hip fires the elbow to the elbow the ball position we just talked about. Now to finish this, I'm just gonna zoom out for a second. I know there's a lot going on here. I think you've exploded the brains of most of the folks watching. Hold your contact with the arm fully extended. That's something we're talking about later on in the challenge is your contact point. But talk to them about, for, for you know, there's people out there that enjoy working out. Mm. All right? If you do a tricep extension, you have limited weight of what you can do with an isolated tricep. Yep. But if you get your back foot... Yeah, I mean, think about, I, I hate to use like CrossFit examples. For those of you who either have done it, if you haven't, you've definitely heard somebody talk about it a lot. Um, no. The, the concept <laughs> the concept, as Nate mentioned, it. let's say I have got a weight behind my head here that I, I'm not strong enough to just pull up with my tricep. If I all of a sudden like bend my legs and then pop with my legs, all of a sudden that weight can float up, a weight that I couldn't just lift with my arms. So the same concept here is exactly what you're doing with your back foot you're just sort of giving it a little nudge to get everything in motion. So we'll just, I'll just play this. We don't have to do slow-mo. I, I highly, highly recommend if you're at home right now, especially, or at work, if your boss is cool, if he's swinging tennis rackets around the office, stand up and mess with this. Stand up and just see if you can sync up pushing off your back foot to activate that racket hand. Because this really is kind of everything, right? Getting in the racket drop, activating the legs, like all of the power that we're going to teach you in this challenge, there's more than 15 miles per hour in just this one piece. Yeah. And there's other bonuses and cherries on top, but if you don't get this right, you're going to have a tough time serving over 100 miles an hour. So, so let's test this out. 
I want, I want Nick Kyrgios has the best serve in men's tennis, period. John is now retired. Comment below. Riley Opelk is out with his hip, right? But like the dude, whether you love him or hate him, is a, has an absolutely amazing serve. Forget about all this stuff down here for now. What I want to show you are the major points of what's happening. So let's start from the waist up. Right there, we see his position is a little bit different than what we were showing you. We really exaggerated to make sure that you're in the same, the correct position. But if you actually look at Djokovic, Djokovic does exactly what we're talking about. Hand stays super loose and he pulls it. He's sort of famous up. for that. That's sort of very loose. Yeah, and it's part start. of the reason his serve improves so much. Right. Right. So here, what we're going to see is the strings over the head. So just like we're talking about. So we're seeing this right to left that we just discussed. Right to left. All right. And now as the feet push down, let me get my, as the feet are loading energy down, the elbow climbs up. There's the racket drop in the elbow position, all right? And from there, we can see contact with the arm fully extended. Now, again, watch the legs here. So the racket is still moving right to left as he's moving energy down. For you more advanced players, the more you can delay your racket on the right side of your body, the better. It's going to travel farther, all right? For some of you that if you just prefer to get in the power position relatively early, that's fine. But for advanced players, kind of that four or five and above, Put the racket on the right side and hold it longer, like we see here with Kyrgios. So racket moves right to left, and this is where we see the energy being driven down. As the energy comes up, there's the racket drop. I don't know what happened to my arrow there. That arrow is a little sad. All right, and there's the racket drop. So the best in the world did. They all have – when we built this challenge, it was all about identifying principles that are universal. Yeah, I mean, look, Nick Kyrgios serve looks nothing like Djokovic's, looks nothing like John Isner, but they all have the five same things in common, right? And those are the five things that we're crossing off the list here as we as we move through this challenge. Um, that is it for today, right? We can open up the floor for some questions. We've got sure. a fair amount in here already. So, guys, anything, any questions you have on anything we've covered so far, start firing them in here. We're on a little bit of a delay, so we'll start working on some of these. Do you want to give us a quick overall recap of day three, and then we'll, we'll dive into some questions? Yeah, I'm good. You good? Okay, cool. Right. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> step one, what no, we talked about was the right to left. All right. Racket only here. Just getting the racket strings pointed down, palm down, wrist super passive, and just get comfortable with moving the racket right to left. If you learn nothing else today, right to left and elbow up, even if you learn nothing else from this serve challenge, that's probably going to give you 15 miles per hour if you're not doing those two things correctly. Because you can't get into a proper racket drop without right to left. And you can't get into a proper, proper racket drop without it. that elbow coming up. And if you don't get into a proper racket drop, you will not serve 100 miles per hour. I've never seen it once in my, in my teaching career. So the next piece we incorporated was getting the toss to lead the racket and then getting comfortable with the racket working right to left to where – the racket and the hitting arm are operating on the non-dominant side of the body. And from there, you want to make sure that you're, you're actually tossing the ball as seen here, all right? Just starting, I'm not telling the ball there. Start an abbreviated toss, racket works right to left, okay? From there, we're talking about elbow the ball drill. And this is making sure for those players that suffer with rate, waiter's tray or internally rotating too early, this is all about pushing through the back legs and getting the elbow up to the ball to make sure that you're in this position. Remember, this is so important. If your elbow's here, your racket's got to go here. Yeah, your racket's got to be in an optimal racket drop. And then finally, it was the pulse-up drill. And the pulse-up drill was just swinging out to contact by using your, your back foot, really powering up, getting the back foot to drive the hip, to drive the arm, and hold the contact point. All right. For you guys that are trying to work on kickers, we're not talking about your kick serve because this is about power. Yeah. But this is also a good exercise to swing under the ball, give the ball some lift, and hold the racket in that point. All right? It'll be a slow kick, but you'll also figure out that you know That's you're, you're getting proper lift. Yep. Yeah. All right.
All right, we got some questions flowing in here. Let's, Let's party. Let me dive right in here. So, Christopher, my man, I'm going to pull you up here. Guys, what I'll Hi, do Chris. is I'll show your question on the screen, and then I'll hide it. I, I did see your feedback yesterday that we left this up here, and then they couldn't see anything we were coaching. So I'll make sure I, I take this down once we, uh, we address it. So Christopher says, going to get ahead a little bit. I've tried to keep the bottom two fingers loose on my grip when I'm serving. And I feel like I'm losing the second bevel at the heel. We talked a lot about yesterday, the continental grip, the heel pad needs to be on that second bevel. And what he's saying is by relaxing his bottom two fingers, he's feeling like he's losing that dexterity, he's losing the ability to sure. keep that heel pad on the racket. So um, I think you're just loosening too much. I mean, I'll let, allow you to add on here. Yeah. But you shouldn't be loosening enough where your heel pad's shifting on your racket. It should just be loose enough where you're not squeezing it to death. Like if, if, you're, if there's any, any muscles in your arm – tightening as you're holding it you're squeezing it too tight but if you're so loose that you're losing the position of your heel pad on bevel two then you're actually holding it too loose yeah i mean in, in focus like, the main thing on your serve is what's happening here right as the rocket's coming through and i'm working out to pronation just be cognizant do it really slow and be cognizant of what's happening through this stage so even if i drop my bottom two fingers off like we've talked about and and, and you know i'm controlling bevel two with my index knuckle and the rest of the hand, just be aware of what's happening at this contact point. Because if my two fingers are off the racket, the heel pad's not on any bevel, right? right? So as my hand moves up from here, then just start thinking about, all right, I'm super loose through the bottom two fingers. Am I staying true in this position? Because if you are through contact and through pronation, it's it's okay through the rest of the motion. It's about where it starts and where it finishes. We talk a lot more about this tomorrow in day three. We go into the, the three finger yeah. drill. So we're Christopher, make sure you dial in tomorrow because we're gonna talk a lot more about this exact topic. Um Ernest says Hey Ernest. Any tips for guys who have shoulder flexibility issues for the racket drop? I can seem to get the serve in trying to restrict the waiter serve, but my racket drop is always 40%. So my guess, and I haven't seen your serve, and a lot of times you guys are going to ask us questions and the answer is we need to see it, but I'll tell you what we normally see. Flexibility issues certainly make it harder to get that elbow all the way up, and that certainly makes it harder to get the racket all the way down. So there's a very real chance that's what's going on. Also, tension in your hand, even if you're not the most flexible guy, can make this way worse, right? Like I've yeah. seen players with perfect flexibility that because there's tension in their arm and in their hand, like you can see it here, and we're going to go into this a lot more tomorrow. I'm going to hog the screen here for a second. If I'm squeezing my racket really tight, even if my elbow comes up, look how far my racket's still pointing off the back of my body here, right? I'm, I'm not getting to here. And so when I think about just relaxing ever so slightly with my grip, you'll notice my elbow is actually allowed to fly up a little bit more. So a lot of people actually do everything we've talked about correctly, and the only thing that's wrong is there's tension in their hand. And so they're not in waiter stray, but they just get stuck right here because the tension, like a bicep flex, doesn't let that elbow fly up and their arm come down their back when they're releasing the tension in their bottom fingers. So I'm not sure if that's applicable to you, but without seeing your stroke, I think that's kind of the best, kind of the best we can do. Only thing I would add is just I think you have to make sure that you're starting with your elbow over here. Right. If you're in a position to where the elbow is on your dominant side. That is like the number one. I, I used to always be like waiters straying the toss, the two things we fix the most. Now it's really players, you know, starting here. And then as the toss happens, they end up in this position. And the racket can only drop, can only drop a maximum two here. Right. My arm just doesn't flex that way. So make sure that elbow is getting behind you, Ernest. And I think that may help as well. For sure, for sure. Um, Jack Perry wants to know, when does the knee bend start? I can field this one. Sure. Um, so... A drill I really like, I did this a lot with juniors actually when I worked at Chevy Chase Club in DC. I would actually put duct tape on their fingertips. Um, so like just reverse a piece of duct tape, put it on your fingertips. And when their toss arm comes down, it's stuck to their shorts and they felt this pull. And that's that's what you want to sync with. So when your toss arm comes down and it should touch your front leg, if you're, if you're right-handed, it'll be your left leg. When your toss arm touches that leg, imagine you've got duct tape or something sticky on the back of your hand, and if that's sticking to your leg, and as that hand pulls up, you're pulling your legs into the knee bend out with it. Yeah. 
a little bit of this is stylistic. I mean, if you look at Casper Ruud, his knee bend happens much, it's much later. earlier. Yep. Yeah, I mean, he's happening as he coils up, he gets into that knee bend. Uh, Nick Kyrgios, to some degree, is getting into his knee bend. But if you take a look at, like, kind of traditional standpoints, if you look at Serena, who used the pendulum, she's not getting into her knee bend until that front foot is starting to pull up. I would just say the, the main thing to be aware of here is that your tossing arm needs to be in a position – that it's released the ball before the knee bend is initiated. Right. So regardless of st stylistic, like if, if the ball is still in your hand and you're starting to bend, it's too early. Yep. Right, release the ball and then allow the knees to flex. Yeah, so honestly, like a checkpoint would be once your arm is all the way up, your knees need to be all the way down. Is that a fair assessment? Close, yeah, pretty close to it. Cool. So something to think about, Jack. I mean, I think most rec players – just the idea of as the arm is traveling up, you're initiating the leg bend. But as Nate mentioned, making sure it doesn't happen too early is important. But just the concept of, you know, once that arm's all the way up, usually you should have sat all the way down. Mm -hmm. That's that's the sink you're looking for. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps. Um, Derek would like to know, could tight back shoulder muscles inhibit, inhibit elbow positioning for a powerful serve elbow can't go up for that because of tightness so yeah i mean sure. guys for sure i mean like any any injury you have like you have a torn rotator cuff you have flexibility issues where you can't get your elbow up and thus get into that full racket drop you got you know tight shoulder blades and you can't rotate all the way back all of this isn't going to help um that said i have all those things and i can still serve 120 miles an hour so it's still possible if you get the right pieces correct is it going to help? Of course not. You know, ideally you would be Gumby like Joe yeah. mentioned and perfectly healthy. But as we enter our late thirties and early forties, I can tell you from experience, that's not super realistic. So there, there are things that you, you, you can do to improve that. I mean, this is all about thora thoracic spine mobility, like kind of the flexibility through the thoracic spine, um, racket fit. I don't, I think Sean Drake still is with racket fit. I'm not sure, but it, it they basically check them out. Racket fit is what it's called. Um, but they basically kind of go through these ex at home exercises that you can do to, to see what your flexibility is and then how to approve it. But yeah, I mean, simply like rotation, kind of what we did in elementary school, it's, it's huge. And if you're limiting that, that's going to affect the serve and you're going to have to have either workarounds or you're going to have to work on that flexibility. I'm getting enough people asking for the link to the recordings again, then I'm going to just post that here for a second while we answer one other question. Let me get that back on the screen. So that is the link. I'm sorry. Next time we do this, I promise it won't be <laughs> quite this long. Um, let's answer one where that I know I'm that that wasn't the best the best thinking. Um, Derek also asked if there's any exercises to help with tight shoulders. Um, I've got a bunch. Get into it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have. I'm technically due for six surgeries right now, both shoulders, both knees, and both wrists, uh, which is awesome because it's like we put in all the same court time as all the guys you see on TV. We just didn't get the millions of dollars for it. So our body hurts the same. So our bank account's thinner. Shame. No, it feels bad. Like, and I, like John Nissner, like I played him in, in a national open in Albany in New York. Beat me really badly. Um, shoulder exercises. And this is, I'm going to go at it from like, hey, you have a torn rotator cuff and you actually just want to build muscles back around it. So this is really like almost PT recommendation here. All the band work. So the stuff where you've got a band either tied to a door or, you know, a weight post and you're just flexing back. So the band's in your hand here and you're flexing back, creating strength here. Same thing both ways. You can flex this way if the band was on this side, pulling back this way. Same concept, pulling back this way. Same thing, uh, I'll hide this really quick so you can see. With the elbow tucked in, the band behind pulling in, the band on the other side pulling out, all of those types of, of band work exercises are good. And as far as stretches, if you just get in your door frame and just extend straight up, almost like you're doing a shoulder press and then lean into the door where you feel it start to pull your shoulder blades back, that's a really good one as well. There's a, there's a bunch of information out there if you Google it. I, I, only thing I'll add is it never ends. I mean, yeah. if you're an avid tennis player, for me, I don't compete like I used to. But if I want to play once, you know, once a week, whatever, twice a week, um, I, I have to kind of maintain bend work with the shoulder. It doesn't take long. It takes 10 minutes. Do it a couple times a week. I, I do have it to typically. stretch for 10 minutes just to get out of bed and be functional yeah. as a human every day. But I think it's all about routine. Like for me, if I do like a, an upper body, if I do like chest and back, I just do bends to kind of warm up before I get into that exercise. For sure. 
All right, guys, we're getting towards the end here. Uh, we'll do two more here. Let me make sure I pick a good one. Um, Not that everyone else's comment wasn't good. Just no, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> You're an idiot. Um, all right, Christopher, I like this one. So Christopher says, pinpoint feels natural, but I've been trying platform and it feels awkward pushing into the ground. Is there an in-between foot position? Yeah, there is. Yeah, so platform doesn't determine like how wide. I stop there. I'm like, yes. Yes, yeah. Platform, you know, it, look at Mon, Monfils. Like he's not pinpoint and he's not platform. He just basically starts with his feet relatively close together, maybe, you know, four or five inches apart. Um, play around with it and, and find what's comfortable. As, as I've gotten older and like hip and knee issues, I don't I, – I'm still pinpoint, but I don't start as wide in the base – to have to pull that foot up as far. I, I just start with my feet a little bit close together, but that right foot still behind that left. So you can definitely kind of play with that and, and see what feels most natural to you. Cool, cool. All right, guys, we're going to shut it down here for today. Hopefully that helped day two. Uh, definitely tune in for day three. Honestly, I would say this is the most important day. Well, that's hard to, hard to say. Day one's important because you got to have the foundations right. But truly, like they're all th important. This right to left, though, and getting into the racket drop by attacking with the elbow up, and then we're going to talk tomorrow about how to make sure you don't have tension in your hand. If you got everything else wrong, you'd probably still serve the ball pretty, pretty freaking hard. So yeah. today's the aha moment for right? sure. So go back into the recordings, rewatch this as much as you need to. Print the workbook out so you've got all the drills that we showed you on the big TV here. And uh, come ready for day three tomorrow. We do want you to practice this stuff. Remember, just like any other challenge, the challenge is to take the drills that we gave you, go out on the court. And the best part about this setup is you don't actually have to go out on the court. You can do this in your house. Go do these drills and make sure you have do your the homework. Field. Yeah, do your homework. Make sure you've got that right to left. Make sure you understand how that elbow needs to approach the ball. And we will see you tomorrow for day three. Same time, same place. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.